When studying large amounts of data, it's possible to focus on just a small part of that data that appears to give significant results. However, it may just be an effect called a clustering illusion. It can happen in many different fields, from scientific analysis to gambling. And giving undue weight to these clustering events can have serious consequences. But scientists in particular have to take care to judge whether a particular clustering event is significant or just part of a wider statistical variation. Let's look at a fairly easy example. Someone generates two random numbers from 1 to 100. The chance that the first one of those numbers is in the 20s is 1 in 10. The chance that the second random number is also in the 20s, again, is 1 in 10. The chance that the two randomly generated numbers are both in the 20s is 1 in 100. However, the chance that two randomly generated numbers are both in any of the groups of 10, be that 20s, 30s, 40s, etc., is just 1 in 10. So this basic form of clustering, at first seems a fairly rare event, is actually quite common. Of course, most scientists are actually dealing with much larger sample sizes. With a larger sample size, these clusters will appear more frequently. The problem then becomes identifying that these clusters are statistically significant or just part of the random fluctuations that normally occur with larger data sets. Here the scientists must avoid the trap what's known as the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. The basis of which is a Texan takes his gun and fires several shots at a barn door. Once he sees where the shots have clustered the most, paints a target around those and claims to be a sharpshooter. It's this same fallacy which may lead gamblers to think they're on a hot streak, assuming that a cluster of wins is likely to continue, or even the basketball shooters getting a streak of successes or even misses, and these events will also occasionally cluster. One example of this clustering which became a major scare at the time and also instigated a great deal of research into the possible underlying reasons was that people living near to high voltage power lines apparently had a four times greater risk of developing childhood leukemia than those living further away from the power lines. All sorts of theories were investigated from magnetic fields generated by the wires to power lines being associated either with a coal fired or nuclear power stations, with some people even moving home for the health of their children. However, some studies found that in other countries this increase in leukemia wasn't repeated, and also there was no viable link between the power lines and the increases in this specific cancer that could be found. So then uh, people began to look more closely at the data and how it had been arrived at. And the original study in Sweden looked at the power lines and people's health, but more importantly it looked at over 800 different medical conditions, whether any one of these had any correlation to people living near power lines. Of course, with that many medical conditions being looked into, some of these would have higher incidences than the rest of the population, and some of them would have a lower incidences. Because childhood leukemia is actually a fairly rare form of cancer, the actual sample size of patients with this condition was relatively small, so the apparent clustering of the patients looked dramatic. When checking 800 different diseases, one of these diseases was bound to produce this type of cluster. So it's always important to remember that the correlation does not imply causation, and that data must always be checked and double-checked to see if there are any flaws with exactly how it's being analysed.